I'm delighted to welcome you to the fourth and final WDSN event for the year, which will be focused on Australian defence industry culture. Particular welcome to those that are attending their first WDSN event this evening as well. We've been very pleased to work closely with the support of Lockheed Martin Australia in delivering these events over the last three years that the Women in Defence and Security Network has been in place. We believe it's established an important community for discussion here in Canberra during that time. This year alone, we've hosted a, a diverse range of events and discussions. We commenced the year with a panel discussion on women in the ADF, enhancing capability and operational effectiveness with Major General Catherine Tui, Rear Admiral Michael Noonan and Air Vice Marshal Warren MacDonald. In June, we hosted a panel discussion on the topics of freedom of speech in a fake news world with Rachel Fork, Nicole <coughs> Buskowitz and Karen Middleton. And in September, we hosted an in conversation with retired Major General Patrick Kamet, examining the importance of gender expertise and women's participation in peacekeeping. Tonight, we're delighted to host a panel discussion with some of the leading figures in the Australian defence industry. While I spend quite a bit of my time engaged in research on women, peace and security, I'm going to admit up front that I know very little about Australian defence industry. So I'm drawing on the words of Andrew Davies, who would be very well known to many of you this evening, in setting the scene a little bit for this evening's event. The next decade will present Australia's defence industry sector with one of its biggest ever opportunities and one of its biggest ever challenges. The government is seized with the idea of using its defence capital acquisition budget to drive innovation and produce high tech jobs for the 21st century. That's an opportunity for obvious reasons. The forecast spend on the defence material over the next decade is a whopping $192 billion, compared with less than half that amount over the past decade. It's a challenge because industry will have to work hard to build the capacity to deliver the quality and quantity of goods and services that the ADF needs. The defence sector competes with other industries for skilled workers and project managers. This discussion will explore the way ahead for the Australian defence industry sector in today's environment. I'm now delighted to introduce our panel and I might ask them to take their seats on the stage if they don't mind at this point in time. First of all, we've got Fran Murphy, who is the Director for Strategy and Business Development at BAE Systems Australia. Fran served as a commissioned officer in a variety of roles that were characterised by strong logistics, operations, personnel management and leadership experience. She joined BAE Systems, in, BAE Systems in 2008 and has subsequently worked in project management and general management roles. Kate Lewis, to the far end, is the Head of Defence and Industry Policy at the Australian Industry Group. Prior to taking up that role in August this year, she worked for the Department of Defence in a variety of roles, most recently as First Assistant Secretary, Defence Industry Policy Division. Suzanne Birch, uh, to her right, is Business Development Management Maritime at Saab Australia. She has over a decade of experience in the defence industry, having spent a major portion of her career with British defence and security company Ultra Electronics and Rolls in the UK and Australia. And directly to my left here, Vince Di Pietro is the Chief Executive of Lockheed Martin Australia, a role he has held since December 2016. Prior to joining Lockheed Martin, he served in the Royal Australian Navy for 40 years with leadership roles in aviation, squadron, shore and joint commands, professional military education, diplomacy, safety and risk management and system safety. Now, I haven't done justice to the careers or the biographies of the people on the stage, and I'm sure they'll elaborate throughout this evening's discussions. We've been delighted for the support of Lockheed Martin, particularly. So thank you, Vince, in taking forward WDSN over the last few years and that ongoing support. So with that in mind, I might hand over to you, Vince, to kick us off tonight and engage in a pretty interesting discussion. So thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Just for the record, I'm actually sitting here to keep the tone and the, and the IQ level of this panel down a bit. <laughs> um, I think that was a, a great, great introduction, a great preamble. Um, but I'd like to just put a, a, perhaps a finer point on why the culture of industry, any industry, is so important if we're going to make the most use of the potential of the available man, man and person power to do the work. If you think about the number that Lisa just mentioned, she said 192 billion between now and 2017 or 2025 actually. Now that's, uh, if you think that every Australian in a lifetime of work generates about a million dollars in taxation earned for the, for, the, for the Commonwealth, that means that the defence commitment over the next decade will absorb 192,000 Australians lifetimes work. And that the equipment and the capabilities that that will turn into will be flown, fixed, sailed, dived, 
by people whose grandparents haven't yet met. So the dimension in time and the commitment of 192,000 Australians' lifetimes work just to fund what we're talking about is actually quite mind-boggling. Money numbers come and go and they get bigger all the time, but when you start thinking of it in terms of lifetimes that it burns into and, uh, and the amount of energy that's going to be expended in, uh, in this space, it's quite, in, quite, an, quite an awesome task that we're taking on here. And so culture, I think, is essential because we've got to make sure we can tap into 100% of the available talent pool in our country to be able to partake in that. And that's where the challenge becomes, I think, a little bit deeper and perhaps a little, a little more in need of the actual focus and attention of every individual in the country to start driving it in a direction which will make sense and return on this incredible investment. So without further ado, what I'd like to do is perhaps just uh, start the panel discussion off and let's just look at a, from a personal perspective in the first instance. Now the journey so far for, 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 for the, my three panellists has been quite a successful one and they have, from hearing Lisa talk about their, their current titles and positions, they've achieved a great deal in their, uh, in their careers so far. So let's try and get a bit of a grasp on the sorts of cultural things that have made that affect uh, what it is for each of them and I'd like perhaps to ask uh, Fran the journey so far and what's made it successful. Mm, thank you. Um, so we've only got an hour and we'll have to contain the IQ and the storytelling I think <laughs> but um, well, when I reflected on what it is I would share I, I would say to you um, sometimes I was just in the right place at the right time and um, someone took a risk on me and I must say as a senior leader in a business I have that conversation quite often. Don't wait till someone's 100% ready, but trust that the architecture around the business or around the organisation is sufficiently deep to sponsor younger people or less experienced people into roles. Um, I think I'm a person who's always been up for an adventure. I've always been prepared to be challenged by something and to perhaps throw myself into deeper water than I always understood. Um, and I haven't ever been focused on what's the end point. Um, you know, so I have been ambitious and I have been prepared to work hard, but I've never sort of had a, an end goal. Um, I've had, had a burning desire to be a contributor to um, people less fortunate. Um, I love it when I give HR the problem of too many apprentices and too many um, graduate roles in an organisation. And... Um, I think really early on, just to make it a little bit gender personal for a minute, really early on in the year that I was commissioned as an officer in the army, um, I had the most amazing mentor who came up to me and said, never ever give away your intellect and your power as a woman and you will find yourself in many places where you're the only woman and never give in to thinking you need to behave like a man and try and think like a man to be a contributor in what you do. I've told that story hundreds of times and I think I've probably held that one very close as I've gone through. Um, I sit on a management board now for the first time ever I have a female colleague. Um, you know, I have spent decades in management rooms um, as a single female and quite often I haven't noticed it because it was so normal. Um, but I've been really clear that I'm a woman and I can be a powerful contributor as a woman. And that would probably be my key message to share with people. Be clear, male, female, where you were born, what gender, persuasion, religion, be really clear that you've got the power to be a contributor in a team. Spot on. Yeah. Terrific advice. Suzanne, what's your, uh, what's your take? Yeah, I'd actually echo what Fran said in that um, certainly uh, in early in my career there was this perception of taking a risk. So I joined uh, Ultra Electronics as a a junior member of the team um, and was just always looking for the next interesting opportunity, the next interesting campaign to be part of um, and that led to different opportunities both in the UK and in Australia. Um, and similarly I never really thought about being one of the only females in the room quite often, even today um, I was saying to the panel earlier that I attended the Maritime Environment Working Group which I think a few people actually were in attendance at as well. Um, 
and I think that's sort of representative of where we're at at the moment, both in defence and in industry, in that there were several hundred people in the room, but a handful of females, both from the defence side and industry. Um, so it's certainly an environment I think we're all used to, is um, being one of few females in the room, um, and certainly something that I think we're, we're keen to change. Okay. Wonderful stories, thank you. And thank you very much for having me here. So it's a real honour and a privilege. Um, I guess if I had gone back 20 years and talked to my uh, law student self uh, studying 18th century uh, English poetry, which has been wonderfully helpful, and uh, <laughs> and, and law, if, if you had said to uh, me that I would be sitting here talking about a career in defence industry, I would have just been the most surprised person on earth. It was just, it wasn't a plan, a little building on a bit what Fran said, it wasn't a plan, I had no goals, I had no, you know, I was going to be a senior uh, female in defence. and. Um, I guess, you know, there were just a couple, so I guess how am I here? I'm trying to reflect on that and, and no doubt, like with all of us and all of our careers, it's, it's not uh, one thing but it is many. And I guess really importantly it was about having a number of kind of characteristics that um, I'm sure um, my panellists share around a, bit, a fair bit of resilience, some, um, uh, you know, important skills around being attracted to the defence industry, what does it mean? I'm very passionate about it and so nothing was kind of going to stand in my way in terms of, you know, what I wanted to do and what I wanted to build and the career that I wanted. Um, but, you know, sitting here, I guess, I do, you know, in some ways do I feel a success? Well, yeah, in some ways I do. But, gee, it's been tough. It has been a really, it has been a tough journey to get here. And um, as my fellow panellists said, it, w it was an eye-opener to me on my first day uh, as the Executive Director of the Defence Council, which is my most of my day job now, um, walking into that room of CEOs. Um, we've got about the... the about the top 35 uh, CEOs in the Australian defence in the country, and every face was male. And that was a real um, uh, eye-opener and a real challenge, I guess. Um, and it was interesting, I suppose, that I was the only female, um, and because my job is really a collaborative job um, rather than a, a, a sort of a competitive P&L um, specific job. So I thought that kind of dynamic was in interesting. But of course, we now have two wonderful women in Gabby Costigan and... Um, uh, Christine Zeitz, of course, from Lidos. Well, that's um, probably a good segue. So what, what, could, could you perhaps, um, Suzanne, kick off? You, you mentioned opportunities and challenges. Mm. What's been the biggest of both? Um, I guess in terms of opportunities, uh, as, as I alluded to before, I think the defence industry presents everyone the opportunity to work on an incredible range of projects, meet fantastic people from a lot of diverse backgrounds, um, the opportunity to travel. Um, I think the biggest challenge that we face at the moment is um, is not necessarily particularly for females in the workforce. It's not the females and the, the culture necessarily of the organisation that we're working with, um, and that's my perspective uh, working at Saab, but it's actually attracting people into the industry and making people aware that the defence industry is an exciting place to work, that there are lots of opportunities because from my own perspective, um, going through high school and into uh, higher education, it wasn't something that was discussed and I don't know if that's unique, um, but certainly talking to some of my colleagues, their journey into the defence industry wasn't necessarily planned um, and I think that's something that we really need to target. As you said, you know, there's, there's a lot of um, work to be done to deliver the programmes that we're, we're seeking to deliver and we need to tap the entire workforce um, and I think if we're going to attract both females and, and younger people into the industry then we need to make it very clear what is on offer in the defence industry um, and the opportunities that are available to everyone. Hmm. Fran, what's, what's been your biggest opportunity and challenge? Um, I'd probably echo Kate, when you ask to come to something like this you do reflect on just how hard the journey has been. Um, and probably then you've got to look in the mirror and admit you're pretty stubborn and pretty resilient to to be able to reflect on just how hard it's been. Um, but if I look forward, I think um, the thing we've got to get right is the conversation we have. Because we do need, you know, the thing that's helped me stay is my absolute passion for the country. And I do think, and we'll talk about this a bit more tonight, but I do think our government is having the right conversation with our population now around who we are as a country and why it's important for us to 
focus on national security and why, why we should be passionate about having sovereignty. So I think that bit's right and that's really helped me in the last few years when it's been very, very tough to stay. But I think, um, I think we need to have our language um, recalibrated around what defence industry means because for a lot of people it can seem a little bit intimidating. But actually in a normal day, you're just working with a bunch of normal people doing something that you can be passionate about. Um, you know, you can break it right down to something quite simple. So while we still just keep talking about science and technology and project management and engineers, I think we still haven't got the language right. Um, you know, I, I, I've run businesses for decades now, but um, I, I'm, I'm a logistician who loves making money, loves people, loves people coming to work and going home safe. Um, and I'm not particularly fascinated by the technology, but I love having people work for me who are fascinated by the technology. So I think you can be quite complementary in the way you come to the sector and what you can do. Um, so yeah, I think um, I think we've, we've got to get our language right, and that's my responsibility. It's the responsibility of all leaders in the in the environment that we're in. Yeah. So addressing that challenge opens its own opportunities. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look, it's a great question. I think I think the opportunities have been enormous for me. I mean, I'm I've got one of the best jobs in the world. It is a fantastic, enjoyable, fun, interesting um, job in in a complex environment. But the opportunities going forward are going to be much, much greater. I mean, the defence industry is just exploding uh, in, in this country and it's just wonderful to see. It's wonderful to go to those trade shows and see those mag magnificent um, uh, equipment and uh, capabilities that we've got in this country. So the opportunities are huge. Um, and they have been, obviously, I'm sitting here, so I've made the most of them. Um, but the challenges, there have been a lot of challenges, I think. and. I can't, sometimes I kind of feel, I've sort of thought about it in terms of we're all climbing up a mountain in our careers and we're all going up and we're all going up in, in defence and I joined with um, 20 graduates and we all went up and I always felt I just had an extra, the women in the organisation maybe had another three or four kilos in their backpack every day. And they would, sometimes they were big things um, and big structural things, sometimes they were family things, you know, trying to get that balance right. Um, and sometimes they were very small things. Um, I always felt there was a bit, uh, quite a lot of soft power used, uh, and I'm using that in a different context from what we normally do, in terms of things like eye contact. Very, very important use of power and um, men and women use eye contact a lot. And I would be in a meeting and the men would not, and I'm generalising of course to sort of make a point, but I wouldn't get eye contact. And that was the extra three to four kilos in my backpack every day that we were kind of climbing the mountain. And I'm making generalisations, of course. But I, I remember being in a, um, uh, a meeting of very senior women in defence and they sort of got to the point where they said, you know, uh, would you want... A lot of them were kind of around the EL2, senior executive level one, and they said, would you want to go on? And they said you know, I'm just a bit tired. I'm tired. I've had enough. I don't want to go on to be the general or the, you know, the um, the SES band two or band three. And I, I just always felt there was kind of a little bit extra in the backpack. And I, I hope, you know, with discussions like this and, and uh, as we go forward that the backpacks might get a little bit lighter. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So what... Okay, we've, we've shared some experiences and some feelings on what what it's felt like. How now do we turn that into, what are the, some of the practical things we can do? Practical things that are probably non-threatening, but return a maximum um, investment, if you like. Okay. Um, <coughs> yeah, I've been putting a bit of thought into this. I think... I think there is, first of all, there's a really important conversation and narrative and 
almost uh, the underlying strategy has to be right. So you could have a whole bunch of tactical issues like job ads and so on, which are, I think are important. But if you don't have that underlying narrative about the why and the what's the chat, well, what's it framing the problem? What are we trying to fix in the first place? Um, so the three of us have had the experience of walking into a room with all men. Um, that makes it challenging and difficult. We obviously kind of intuitively realise that we're missing out on um, a great portion of the population and their skills in our industry. I think really understanding what the implications of that are. Um, so that's around uh, really important things like skills and having a, that, that kind of boardroom conversation around what is it and, um, and also in the general population, what are we missing out on here specifically? And then I think it makes it easier to address the change. So for example, uh, there's a lot of research around decision making and how div more diverse groups make better decisions if they have a diverse, uh, and that's not just gender, of course, there's other diversity um, characteristics. But I think if you have that conversation and you understand and get the hearts and the minds, then you can have an underlying um, uh, kind of that real sensation that we must change, not just that it would be nice for us not to have to walk into a room full of men and feel kind of, you know, it, that slight threatening and, and intimidating feeling. So I think it's a whole ecosystem setting. And then there are really practical strategies that you can do right from the job advertisement. So I know um, I have, uh, I understand that you can uh, attract a lot more women through the way that you um, word job advertisements to make them inclusive, for example. Uh, retention strategies around that mentorship um, that Fran mentioned, that really important mentor that she had. Um, and right through, you know, how to not only attract but also retain women in the workforce. Suzanne, would you like to? Yeah, I, I was just thinking about the challenges and um, thinking about Kate's point. Um, it's sort of interesting. I, I actually, particularly coming into Australia, I haven't. I've noticed obviously that you know the the industry is predominantly um, male. But one of the challenges I face is actually not being an engineer um, in my daily existence, particularly in the business development environment. Not being ex defence, not being an engineer. Um, you know, they're some of the challenges that you face, and um, I think I, I guess you face those challenges in every industry, depending on your your skill set and what you're trying to achieve. But in terms of attracting a different set of people into the industry, I still think it's a national problem. Um, as we talk about um, the skills that we need to de deliver the projects that are coming um, down the pipeline, I think it's actually changing the perception of defence and defence industry and talking to people in schools and making it appealing and understood for families, actually, and people who are talking to their children about what the career options are and the career counsellors being aware of the opportunities industry um, and I think Lockheed actually has some uh, initiatives to go into schools and um, talk to career counsellors about the different types of careers that are available um, and I really think that's where we need to focus a lot of our energy um, is educating the broader population about the industry and what it's got to offer. Brad, your thoughts? What more practical things can we do? Yeah, I do think everyone has a role to play I mean, obviously, more senior people who've got a leadership position can be quite influential in the conversation that's happening in boardrooms or inside a leadership team, inside the community of practice. Um, some of that is role modelling um, and some of it is, you know, deliberate decision making around changing conversation. Um, I do think that um, you need the strategic piece right. So if you look at... Um, dare I say, look at South Australia, you know, the conversation that we're talking about in South Australia around the, um, the workforce that needs to be built, rebuilt. Um, you know, parts of it are there, parts of it need to be rebuilt, whole pile needs to be brought in. Um, I still think we need to have um, a lot more certainty about workforces and we need to be able to have conversations with kids as they come through school um, with different language. Um, because the piece around engineering, we absolutely need engineering in high technology defence companies. But you need really good schedulers and good estimators and good project managers. And a lot of those skills are actually very suited to um, particular ethnicities or, or, you know, women in particular, very good at the attention to detail stuff. Um, and also the jobs where you're juggling lots of balls, like by my nature, don't give me one job with one subject and one person to talk to, because it's not me. I'm actually like multiple subjects and you know multiple issues on any given day. 
So we need to be playing to the strengths of people more in our conversation in school. And, and I still don't think we've got that right. So how do you inspire parents to change the conversation at home if we don't get the right story from government around jobs for life? You know, we're about to get to that place. But um, And then stop focusing just on Lego and engineering. Um, the Lego program is great, by the way, but, you know, <coughs> it, you don't have to be able to build a robot to be a real key contributor to defence. So we've, we've still got to get the language right and value um, more of the variety of jobs that we take for granted every day that are actually essential building blocks to delivering programs. Well, one yeah. of the things that catches my eye is that industry actually has a really pretty good idea of what the demand will be for all of those things, you know, from the technical to the non-technical. What we don't actually own is the supply levers. Like who talks to the kids in the primary, the secondary school, the indenture yeah. programs, the apprenticeships, the universities, because that's all somewhere else. <coughs> and by labelling it as a defence industry challenge, it's almost like lobbing the cat over the fence and saying, oh, defence will sort that out. <laughs> and it's kind of not that easy. We need an awful lot more buy-in and, and to your point, Fran, you know, discussions around dinner tables. You know, Kids do listen to the family and the family elders, and, yeah. and, and they do listen to teachers and they do listen to peers. Yeah. And until we get the conversation running in a in a way which is largely industry label agnostic, um, I think we're going to have a bit of a challenge. But that's probably enough from uh, from from me. We'll give the panel a bit of a break. Perhaps if I can have some questions from the floor uh, to any of the members on the panel, um, not including me, because I'm. <laughs> Hi, Michelle. Um, I'm interested in your strategies on the day-to-day workplace for... Oh, hello. Hello. Um, I'm interested in your strategies in a day-to-day -day workplace for the sort of everyday sexism or small comments that aren't worth making a big deal about. Um, how do you deal with them? What's your strategy for dealing with that? Um, Okay, so I'm going to tell you it's probably different in this decade to the previous one. I've probably um, acquired some calendar years and a little bit more patience. Um, and I apologise to the men in the room if this sounds like um, a real, you know, gender bias kind of conversation because there's a lot of really good men. Um, but um, in the defence sector, you're often dealing with people where um, posi it's positional power rather than, um, you know, positional leadership, rather than leadership through comfort in themselves. Um, and generally I find when I'm in a meeting and they haven't made eye contact for 20 minutes because they presume that I'm the administrator taking the notes, <laughs> and they then realise that actually the men on either side of me are taking the notes, um, they will ask for my business card after the meeting and that gives me great personal satisfaction. <laughs> Man, so, a trick there. Yeah, um, I've just, you know, I, probably 20 years ago, I had a lot more fire in my belly. I've still got a big fire in my belly about it, but I was probably a lot more, um, I, didn't, I didn't accomplish my message as well because I was angry, you know, and so I'd say something at the time and that actually didn't serve me very well. So I've really had to practice how do I, um, work through those meetings without losing some of my own self-confidence in the room because that's actually what's already happened. You know, they've taken some of my relevance in the room away by blanking me out. So I just refuse to give them that power. Um, and I generally take great satisfaction in giving them my business card and when they read it, they and you could see on their face, you know, oh my goodness. <laughs> now, now, Kate, you and I have spent some time in the trenches of Russell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In various exactly. committees. Um, um, so, look, uh, like, Fran, I would, I would preface my answer by saying, look, I have worked with fantastic men yeah. who have been extremely supportive of me and, in fact, have been champions of mine. So, you know, um, I wouldn't want to um, go past without actually mentioning that. I've had fantastic male leaders and terrible male leaders. I've had wonderful female leaders and hopeless female leaders have been very destructive. So, you know, that's kind of the context of which I'm answering a very, very good question. Um, but just to, to answer your specific point, there, are, there have been times um, and places where I thought, ouch, that's really hurt. Like I was uh, moderating a panel, quite a, a very high level panel, and it was very challenging for me. I'm not, uh, I don't really enjoy public speaking at the best of times. And this was a new challenge for me, actually, moderating. 
And so I, I did this huge amount of preparation and I, you know, got the team together and I asked all the questions and I, you know, I stood up there and I did this thing for a whole hour. The minister was there and I was my boss. And I sort of, it came down, we're talking afterwards and, and I was talking to a very senior male um, industry person and he said, you know, the best thing about you is your smile. And I, at first I thought, oh, oh God, then I thought, oh, do I have something in my teeth and oh, is it good enough? And I got all obsessed about my smile. <laughs> and then afterwards I kind of thought, actually that was a really strange comment to make because I'd, I'd kind of put all my, my heart and soul into moderating this panel and making it glow and, you know, doing a great job like, um, uh, like Vince is doing. So, and I thought afterwards, you know, should I have said something? But, but what do you say? Well, that's an awful thing to say. Don't say that to me. That's terrible. You know, and so uh, I'm not sure there really is a good answer. I think the answer is more generic um, and creating an ecosystem and a culture and a, um, rather than snapping back at a particular point where you look mad and um, fragile and yeah so so I think it's these kinds of conversations rather than of course you've got to judge the individual incident um, on its merits and exactly what happened but um, you know I think changing the whole culture is the answer rather than maybe a snap decision but I don't know I'd be really interested in your feedback as to what I should have said at that point <laughs> about my smile. <laughs> Suzanne? Yeah I, it's actually interesting I've, I've face some of the things, you know, assumptions that you're there to get the coffee and take the notes and those kind of things. Um, but I actually find more and more that um, even in my team in the UK but also in Australia, it's actually my male colleagues who get more annoyed with that kind of behaviour than even I do because it sounds awful, I'm almost used to that sort of thing happening. And it's actually my colleagues who'll say something or they'll they'll make, make a point of letting everyone know who the team is and who the members of the team are and what our roles are, um, which is which is fantastic. Um, yeah, and I agree with Kate. I don't think there's any easy answer, and I think not losing your temper and not letting it knock your confidence, which is something that I struggle with, particularly early on, was if someone was very dismissive, then that would be the end of the meeting for me because I think, well, okay, they've dismissed me. Clearly, I have nothing useful to say, so I'll stop talking. Um, and so I think that's a big challenge. Um, but yeah, it's fantastic when you work with people who actually identify with the problem and, and support you. Um, so I think that's something that can definitely help as well. I find the best learning curve is three very highly educated daughters. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Hi, if you could identify yourself too, please. Uh, <coughs> Hi, I'm Mincha. I'm from DFAT. I just had a question in regards to, and, and this is somewhat of a generalisation, but certainly women deal with perceived risk and sort of uncertainty very differently to a lot of men. And in an industry that is based on innovation and change and will certainly have a lot of change in the next two decades, how do you see the challenges of attracting women and dealing with that differently and I guess unique to that aspect? Yeah, look, I, I think that's a really great question and I know that's kind of a theme that runs through. If you look at the literature around um, women in defence and attracting women into male-dominated uh, environments, uh, there is this theme about um, uh, women being more perfectionists, having different standards, you know, oh my God, I'm in this room of men, I have to be totally perfect at everything, my standards are incredibly high and it can make it... Um, uh, retention quite difficult and also not going for promotion quite difficult generally um, and I think it's a great question about well how can you be sort of innovative in that environment um, and where you're risk-taking and maybe you're risk-taking and putting yourself out there and maybe being judged is lower so um, again I think it's about creating the environment I think it's cre about creating um, uh, you know that strategic and supportive environment I think it's about employers making sure that you know uh, they're really clear about what the risk parameters are and um, and really encouraging women um, you know to, to not be such perfectionists around the, I know I suffer from it myself at times and uh, it's you know it, it is a hard thing to overcome but I think I've tried to you know reach out to women and say look you don't have to be perfect all the time you know just be do the best you can absolutely it's going to you know it, it, it's going to be just as good as the men Yeah, so um, it's, uh, my reflection would be that um, while that's true in you know quite a stereotypical way around um, our nature, um, inside defence, we actually have um, like a very high percentage of men, obviously, 
And where they're working in technical work, they're nearly always um, very conservative about risk. So yeah. there's actually, you know, like quite often I'll be the radical person, um, you know, and I'll be saying, well, surely if you spend a bit more R&D here, we could, you know, w weld the pink one to the blue one and everything would be right, you know, but, but that's what I'm being facetious. But so I think um, there's a that's probably to the point around we need to get the conversation right because inside inside our defence world um, we've got this extraordinary capability and this extraordinary intellect and you see um, there's a lot of very shy, very introverted, very risk adverse um, men as well as women mm -hmm. and um, you know my my first day when I was. Um, General Manager Weapon Systems, um, I did my floor walk, which is one of those leadership things you do to try and go and say hello, and nobody made eye contact. In an ITAR controlled area of 150 people, I walked up and down all the corridors and nobody looked at me. And I walked out of there absolutely devastated. <laughs> absolutely devastated. I'm a complete failure. I'm never going to get this job right. But actually, most of the guys in that room were holy you know, I, I can't make eye contact with her. And they were the ones who were risk adverse and they were the ones who were shy. So, you know, there's also a part where, so the next week I did it again, but I bought donuts. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, sometimes that um, diversity thing, you've got, to, you've got to bring something complimentary to the nature of other people. And I think I'm blessed that I was able to see um, those aspects of my workforce. So... Yeah, I think I think we might have it in us on some things, but men have got lots of conservatism and anxieties and you know ego issues as well. They're sometimes just a little bit they're buried differently. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree. And uh, yeah, it's interesting you say that because in my experience, particularly from the dynamics of sales versus engineering, which is always something that we talk about, um, the level of conservatism is always quite different. Um, mm -hmm. But I reflect on your story about um, making eye contact. I had a similar experience when I first joined the workforce in the UK and walked into the kitchen and sort of started making conversation with a few of the engineers that were in there. And similar, no conversation, looked away and ran out of the room. Like, oh, my God, is it, what have I done? Is that me? Um, so I think there are challenges for everyone. It's just, um, yeah, they're just, they're just different. Hello, Alexia Jump from Rapid Context. Um, so I have a question around um, diversity and the, the statistics. So I believe the evidence is there that says that companies perform better if they have diversity on their board. The statistics are there to support it. So what's missing in the narrative? Why isn't that breaking through and why are we still talking about quotas and not the bottom line of what we can do? Mm. Um. So I come from a company where we really like to champion our own. You know, we've got, we, we take a lot of corporate pride in having people see um, a long runway in their career, let's put it that way. Um, so the first place we would look for people who were going to join the board would be internally. And we have a huge air gap between um, our graduate and entry level people taken as a whole, it's a generalisation, and those people who are ready to move into general management, senior leadership and um, and board roles, who've, got, who've had sufficient diversity in their career to be able to compete for those roles and, and win them. So, um, you know, this the challenge is um, how, how do we get everybody focused on the problem? And that is why we do have targets. We do have gender targets because we believe we need to actually um, have the conversation at a management level not weekly, but monthly on what are you doing? And every empty role, how are we attracting a broader community of people to apply for it? Um, so that, and I, and so I think the targets are probably right while we've still got that challenge. But then the other challenge is time. You know, how do we, how do we get people to come back after they've had their bubby? How do we um, get people to stay when they end up with one of those bosses that's um, not your preferred leader? male or female, you know, how, how do we get people to stay and what conversation do we have in the organisation so that I have got someone tapping on my shoulder because that would be great, 
you know, there were people knocking on my door saying, get out of the way, you know, it's my turn at your job. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question sufficiently, but it certainly in our organisation, I think in many defence organisations, it's a challenge having sufficient um, uh, female talent coming up through through the levels. Yeah, yeah it's definitely the same in SAAB. I mean, there's, there's certainly a desire to have more females at that level, but we just don't have um, either internally or externally access to those people who've got the right experience. Um, you know, we look at people, you know, we've probably got, I can think of maybe two or three people who are female who've got 20 or 30 years experience in the industry and that's it. Um, and they might not be suited for the board necessarily or even want to go that far. And I think that's the other challenge. Um, is there are some people who feel comfortable with the level that they've reached, even if they have the potential, they don't necessarily want to go that far. Um, so I think it's something that is across the industry, mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah, yeah, I just build on that a little bit to say I think you're absolutely right. I don't think the conversation is right. I don't think the, um, I, I don't think that compelling evidence is out there and um, understood um, that you mentioned. I don't think I don't think it is. I think you know, as I said at the beginning, I think there's a bit of intuition that this doesn't look right. This is a strange room, um, but it's not. It, it it isn't there in a compelling way. And then there's a range of reasons how you know how to implement a quota system and you know over what period of time. Um, and how do we cater for the, you know, uh, all the range of issues that you need to look at? Yeah, and I'm not sure if this is a fair comment, but there almost seems to be a perception that females are being discrimi discriminated against and that they're not getting the jobs, but there's thousands of women who are applying for these positions, whether it be engineering sales, board level positions. And in speaking to our HR department, the experience is vast majority of applicants are male um, we just aren't getting the people applying for these positions and so I think I think that's the challenge. Mm -hmm. that's the question, isn't it? <laughs> um, so in relation to getting women to apply for jobs um, the evidence um, that I've read in relation to that is that women will generally only apply for a job if they meet 100% of their criteria so therefore if the criteria is not full-time you may see a difference in that supply and that's coming from a company who um, we currently only employ women. We have 100% women on staff and all women work remotely and flexibly. Um, so our experience is in our employment. We have never advertised for a full-time position and consequently um, when we get a response from the market, it's 75% female in the response um, and we are targeting areas that men are very qualified in as well. So just putting that out there as an idea. Yeah, can I... Oh Shall I go first? Um, you're right. And um, just recently, we had this conversation in the company again. Don't apply for full. Don't don't put it out there for full time. And um, make it clear that if people have been out of the workforce for a while, we'll celebrate bringing them in and reskilling. And um, we just didn't get a take up. So there's something about defence um, that's intimidating people. So, we, you know, we've actually got people working at the moment on it, not changing our brand because our brand is who we are, but um, when people read it, the advertisements, that they get something from the advertisement they're not getting today. Because we we didn't mind whether we hired 25 part-timers, whether they needed reskilling in four different areas, um, whether they're all going to be issued with, you know, laptops to work from home. We, you know, was that, we were really on that kind of recruitment drive and we got a really appalling response. So it's also about how do we get the language right and the, um, the pictures, the print, this, without feminising the brand completely, we've got, to, we've got to get that bit right as well, yeah. Yeah, I think in terms of culture, we, we from the Swedish reference, we definitely have the balance right and um, I think there's there's a lot of progress to, to look to there. Um, from an Australian perspective, I think um, we're potentially behind the curve in terms of looking at part-time employment because certainly from an engineering point of view, it's very much full-time. Um, and we're just coming to grips with the idea of remote working and those kind of things, having that level of flexibility. So I think that's definitely something that, that we, could, we could work on, but it doesn't sound as though it's necessarily successful, which is a bit of a challenge. It's successful once you've got them in the business. Yeah. Um, for, for everybody, for men and women, you know, but um, getting them in is still, you know, getting the right mixture of genders in is still a challenge for us. 
Fran, do you ever take an eye to your own advertisements and say, Ooh. like when you see a company advertisement for something, mm. do you ever look at it and think, well, that's a, a lovely way to put it, or this is this is not the smartest words to use? Because <laughs> it's kind of, do you know where I'm coming from? No, I know where you're coming from, and I'm going to have to admit that I don't look at them very often. <laughs> um, you know, just, yeah, probably don't go looking at them often enough but I do I have just recently had two junior executive roles and um, working inside my team and um, and again I'll just say um, I love the men in my team you know I absolutely value their contribution and what they bring but I really wanted to challenge the men who were doing the recruitment to target um, real diversity in the panels that they you know who they interviewed and um, we didn't actually run advertisements. I said, you've just got to go out and tap the market and talk to people, go and introduce yourself and buy, you know, drink lots of terrible coffee. I didn't want to actually um, advertise because I think um, we, ju we just have, as a company, we're working really hard on getting that better. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You know, I think um, even our recruiters, once they're in, they, they want a picture of a big ship or a very fast jet, or, you know, and that just doesn't sync with a, a, a lot of our ladies in the community, um, including my own well-educated daughters. They, they could do really well in my sector, but they can't imagine coming to work in my sector. So that's my, my <laughs> litmus test of why it's yeah. not right yet. Yeah. Yeah. What's the general experience from, from the audience? When, when you see an ad, does it, does it hit the right target? I mean, what, what's your general view? Do you, do you, do you look at ads and think, I generally look at ads and think, gosh, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. But I know that... Sorry. I know that I have uh, a pretty good boss uh, who constantly pushes me who, uh, and has almost convinced me that I can do things. Um, <laughs> almost. Um, so part of the things is when I do look at a job, um, I just think I don't, I can't do that. But I probably could. Um, I'll go straight to the policy on the website and see what the maternity leave is as a big pull for me. And in fact, yeah, I'll look around the community and I know I could tell you the maternity leave of all the, the options available to me. That's one of the big ones for me. Claire Hollingsworth from Omni Executive. Just Something that we're probably all looking at, what changes in our industry uh, are we looking at to, to create that work-life balance, that, we're, that mythical work-life balance that we're all talking about? You know, all of us here, when we do go for that, that job that we're 100% committed to, and then everything else in our lives seems to suffer for that next five-year cycle, how do we get that right? So... I'm going to put my hand up first and say I do a lot of mentoring. There's people in the room who I've mentored, so if they start laughing, they've heard this before. There's a part of every job, doesn't matter which sector you're in, where you've got to be really clear what you want and what you're prepared to give up. You know, so there is a bit for me where I think, and maybe I'm a dinosaur, maybe I'm from a generation where I've got it wrong, but I think... Um, you can't have everything all at the same time and you've got to give yourself time. So, you know, I used to say to myself, I'm not going to let myself get promoted. I was pretty sure the company would eventually promote me to be a general manager, to run a big P&L. And I kept saying, I'm not going to let that happen until my children finish high school. Well, I let it happen. <laughs> and I think I was a terrible mother and a terrible general manager for about 18 months, really. You know, when I reflect back, I wasn't... I wasn't on my game at work as well as I could have been if I hadn't been worried about kids. And um, occasionally the school would ring and say, one of your daughters is sick, and I'd say, can you keep them in the sick bay? I'll be there in an hour, because I just simply couldn't get there. I was somewhere else. So um, I think you have to be really clear, what do you want? What do you really want professionally? And how will that you know, fix a button, like turn the buttons on for you personally, because you're professing 
does give you a personal satisfaction. And what mix of life do you want to live and how are you going to do that? Yeah, I, would, I would second that actually to say that from a sales <coughs> perspective in terms of the job that we do, um, there's a lot of travel, there's a lot of late night calls, um, a lot of social functions. It's actually, you know, I, I don't have children myself and I actually think it would be incredibly difficult to manage that kind of work balance with with a family. Um, and so perhaps that is one of the challenges that we need to deal with if we want to get more females into particularly business development and sales roles is um, how we manage that because from my perspective it's just the way the job is and, and I have I have personally have no issue with that but I think a lot of people potentially would. Yeah, I, I, um, I understand exactly what you're saying and, and um, just building on that, I guess it's about, uh, you know, the, the business deciding what, what is a competitive edge and how do you, you know, how, how do they frame that as a competitive edge if they're going to. Um, and I'm not sure we've got, I, think, I always think that's a really interesting phrase, work-life balance, isn't it? Because I love my work, it is my life. And my life is my work, but I have a beautiful daughter, and I spend an enormous amount of time with her. Actually, um, so uh, you know, my life really uh, work is a huge part of my life, and it's a wonderful part of my life, and I, uh, I really enjoy it. So I, I, I think that's a I, maybe it's a whole a discussion for another day, but you know, there's a real philosophy around is work part of your life. Um, gee, this one really, and then we'll come back to. You. Hi, thank you very much for sharing your stories. I'm Rebel from Westpac, so we've come, we've got a 50% women in leadership at the moment, so this is really eye-opening to hear you talk about the challenges. But I just had a question um, about work-life balance and how you can get that in the organisation because I've been reading something recently that is that the work-life balance is more important to millennials and getting younger people. Do you find that it's not, it's, difficulty finding talent in general or just difficulty in finding female talent um, as the workforce changes? Um, so I think there are some, um, so if I'm, if I'm recruiting a 45 year old male, he's probably more inclined to expect that he'll work from eight to five and a 45 year old woman, a woman would probably be the same. Um, my challenge, and, and I do this with my people all the time, is if you've been on the phone till 9.30 at night, don't get out of bed at 6 o'clock. Stay in bed until 7.30. You know, you're still going to be available during the target hours of 9 to 4 or whatever it is. You've got the technology to silence your phone, and I'm never going to judge where were you at quarter to 8 in the morning. You know, so I think um, the challenge is different. If you bring somebody in who's never had that work-life balance, how do you enrich their experience? support them in growing confidence in themselves so that they've got an enriched experience by working as part of the team. Um, and then, because that's in complementary to the younger generations that are coming through where men want, want to co-parent. Um, in many cases, um, you know, the men want to work part-time and the women are back in the workforce faster after Bobby's. Um, and, and still, all we want from them is what they've made a commitment to deliver to us and we should be um, really ju non-judgmental about where they do that, provided that it's on our technology and they're safe, you know. So I think I think we're on that journey um, and we're getting better at that all the time. But I don't use it as a discriminator when I'm meeting someone who might work, join the workforce. The fact that, um, you know, a young man is looking for that, um, it's interesting to me, but it's equally interesting that I would bring in someone who hasn't had that experience and 12 months later we're celebrating that they are. I think that's quite an enriching experience for me as a leader. Yeah. I think one of the factors is also not necessarily whether you work nine to five or you know specific hours, but it's also whether you're efficient when you're at work. Um, and I've sort of noticed that you know looking at and working briefly in Germany and looking at how they tackle their work day, they're incredibly industrious while they're at work, but they're very you know clear about their working hours. Um, and I do find that in some of our sites, there's a bit of a culture of oh, I'll have a coffee, I'll have a chat, I'll read the paper, go and have another chat. And you think, Jesus Christ, it's 11 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I think that's maybe something that we need to target as well. 
I think it reflects the changing face of work, which you kind of, you know, it's your office is your laptop and, you know, obviously the millennials is so much more fluent. I mean, my daughter is 11 and she can just outfox me completely on a computer. Um, and I think that reflects that. And, and I think it's uh, the best employers are going to be the ones who adapt to that uh, and, and go with that change. Hi, Kyla from NAC. Um, I wonder your thoughts, um, just tackling what you've mentioned, Fran, about um, flexible work. And I grapple with the idea of um, a, it's almost a, a positive discrimination and, and talking about women. Is it not potentially better to talk about flexibility in the workforce for male and female and, and make it gender irrelevant? Because particularly for those women that do want to go into management roles, citing your example of, of you know, your daughter being sick, someone's got to go and pick them up. So it's got to be just as acceptable for the blokes to do it as much as it is for the women to do it. And without that, that platform, it's still going to be one gender's you know, traditional role. So I'd, I'd like your thoughts. Yeah, sure. So um, contextually, there was no... Um there was no man. I was a single mother, um, and uh, um, and I did actually get to the point where I said to the company, "I can't do this job anymore." And the company paid for my nanny for two years to keep me in the job. Um, so you know, um, an organisation was it wasn't BAE; it was a previous business where I would have said, "You know, if you tested me, are they really focused on um, valuing individuals?" And I would have said. Oh, I don't think so, but they forked out a lot of money to keep me in my job. So I was, I was blessed, and so were my children. Um, you know, it's interesting. You can't have a conversation about um, gender without at least one person in the room challenging the positive discrimination. And I really get that because um, I get this sort of feeling in my stomach, like, oh no, here we go again. You know, um, we're talking about women, um, and I actually. Um, challenge at management board a lot around that you know why are we me measuring the number of women non-execs and women execs why are we not measuring um, the number of men under the age of 40 who are co-parenting and working part-time and why are we not measuring the number of people who've got a parent um, who needs to go to rehab twice a week and they're taking you know they're working flexibly to be able to be involved with the family at the other end of life um, and I'm always told by HR, well, you, you can't invade people's privacy that much. You know, flexible work, the whole thing about flexible working is you're not meant to be collecting data on 25 different data points. <laughs> what the hell are you doing yeah. when you're not in the office? But I do think that that's, um, that that's the richness of community when we've got all of those things happening and you're aware of it as part of the workplace. I do think, though, that um, if we go back to, you know, kind of where we started this, um, in a sector where we're going to need to have thousands of incredibly talented and committed people building ships, maintaining the new F-35s, um, building submarines, um, building little ships you know, in WA and, and in South Australia, um, you know, there's just such massive commitment being made by our government to our, our national security. Um, it would be wrong of us not to try and get the gender balance right. And I think sometimes you have to have the conversation about gender balance to get it right. Um, but what good looks like is we're not talking about it anymore. You know, 50-50, why not? That would be great, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, okay, we've got three. Are you all happy to continue for three questions? And we'll call that, because I'm just, Make conscious that there's food and drink out there. <laughs> Not that I need any more tonnage. <laughs> okay, let's uh, go right to left. Um, hi, my name is Krista Bullock. Um, I've spent 20 years in the United Defence in the Department and in um, Industry. <laughs> um, and particularly in the last um, few years, I specialise in defence, estate and infrastructure. So again, you know, very male dominated area. I've been in meetings in the last 12 months with CASG, where I was the only female and probably the only person under 50 in the room. And yet I've been in meetings with defence estate where my project manager was the only male in the room. So I can see that there's been great changes. But 
working in defence industry, I'm with Deloitte, who is just amazing with diversity and culture, you know, men, women, uh, uh, religion, age, that kind of thing. But I've also just come from an engineering company where I had to get out because I was never going to be promoted, the only senior female in the business. So I'm wondering, because there is such disparity between defence industry companies and what they're doing, whether something's going to look across industry like the Property Council did the male champions of change, is something going to happen looking at all of industry rather than leaving it up to the individual companies? Uh, look, good question. It's a great question. I'm not sure I, I really have the answer. Um, I know. I, I mean, I guess I'd make a couple of general observations. Thank you for sharing your story. Uh, I think that's really important. I think there'll be um, when the defence is doing their skill and STEM strategy. I think there will be uh, a look right across. You know, when as they're building that strategy, I think it'll be really important to, you know, look at um, gender issues, other diversity issues, and they will be looking across. Uh, I think businesses understand that there is a competitive edge here and that they will be working towards that competitive edge and if you want a competitive edge you're going to have to have the best of every uh, everybody and that's gender and that's other diversity issues as well. So I probably can't answer your question totally, I'm sorry. Could we perhaps put that up at the Australian Industry Group? Yeah, <coughs> good, 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 good Big point. table full of people good point. saying how about we all take a straw poll of the things that we're doing which are different, mm. oh. not, the, not the run of the mill stuff but the things that we're all doing as initiatives and just see how many people take up on them. You know, even if you only get two or three ideas yeah, getting okay. traction in other places, Great suggestion. We, we start tracking in the right direction, yeah. or in a better direction. Yeah, because yeah, I think we're in the right direction, it's just not getting there very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was two more. Uh, <coughs> Um, Susan Egan from Defence. Do you believe that um, capping the amount of time in which people sit um, in executive level positions to allow the change out and more diversity coming through, so promoting women into positions? So someone can only stay in an ECS, you know, band role for three to four years, kind of in the equivalent swapping out of military positions. So uh, my personal view is I think... Um that should be very gender neutral. I think um, unless something cataclysmic happens inside your portfolio, um, you know, so there's been a major change which has caused you to sort of almost reconstruct your frame around how you're delivering, um, like a change of CEO. So I'm using that as my reframing because, you know, I have a new CEO in January. Um, I think all of us have got to use by date because we get a bit too comfortable and you actually do need some constructive friction in leadership, in senior leadership roles. Um, so certainly when I took this role on, you know, I said, do you want to put me on a contract? I'd probably prefer seven years just so I know, you know, where the cash flow is going. But <laughs> five years, I'll negotiate that with you. And they said, oh, no, we want you to stay forever. I said, well, do you, where, where are I going next? You know, so I think, but I think that of men too. I think um, if we're too long in any one job, um, we're at risk of ourselves becoming the naysayer in the room. Oh, I've seen that, done that before. It didn't work last time, you know. So, yeah, yeah, that's my view. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. I think a general policy of, you know, um, cycling people through, yeah, um, yeah you know, is important. Um, that said, I'm not one of these people who thinks that, uh, you know, I, I think some of our best employees are the ones who stay with their company their whole lives mm. and make them be in the same job. But, you know, that, that there's huge strength. You need both, I you think, do. a balance. You need mm. fresh blood and fresh ideas. But, you know, that, that um, length of, of service can be a real strength as well, gender neutral. Mm. Yeah, and I think um, it is interesting from an industry point of view looking at the different management styles and techniques because I've worked in teams where we've had people who've been there for 20 or 30 years who have a lot of value but not necessarily the freshest perspective on things. I've also worked for CEOs who believe that a 10% churn every year is the way to go and that just keeps people on their toes. Don't necessarily agree with that at all but um, it was an interesting way to approach keeping people um, motivated mm -hmm. so uh, yeah. Not sure there's Depends when your 10% up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <exactly. laughs> and we'll, we'll go for the last question. Hi, um, Kate Glenn from Department of Defence. Uh, do you see any link between the evolution of defence culture and the flow on effects for people seeking employment in defence industry? Or do you think that perhaps legacy 
cultural issues in defence are keeping people away? And is, or do you know if anyone's kind of tracking the link between like ADF culture and evolution and defence industry take up from more kind of diverse applicants? I could probably only give you an intuitive response, Kate, which is not uh, one based on, on evidence. But um, I, in my experience in, as part of the senior leadership group in defence, I thought um, the number of um, coloured jackets, as we used to say, uh, was growing um, and faster than the defence industry. But that, that's just kind of an intuitive, at, at those most senior levels. Um, and I'm not quite sure that was just a, a, a personal impression. Um, I don't have figures. But I just felt that was probably a public service culture a little bit. Um, but you would think that there would be some cross-pollination there and that they would be growing. Um, but I, yeah, I definitely saw the numbers of females in the SES ranks growing over the time that I was there. There was a huge change, particularly in the last five years. They hadn't quite yet seen in, in industry, despite some great examples coming. Yeah, I think one of the challenges we face in the, the business development area is a vast percentage of the, the people who come into that come from defence, um, tend to be sort of generalising, but tend to be middle-aged, um, ex-military people, male, um, and there just doesn't seem to be the equivalent number of females coming through and looking to defence industry to transition. I'm not necessarily sure whether it's just they're not there or they're not interested in joining defence industry, um, but that's definitely a pool that I think is untapped. Yeah, I, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd draw on um, any data out of uniforms, you know, out of the services and reflect on that at the department le level and then reflect on that at industry level. I think, you know, I, I think services have made massive inroads in the last decade around um, diversity on, on all sorts of levels and you can see really good data on that now. Um, I think um, it comes back to that what's our conversation, you know, what, why are we not attracting people or how are we ending up with people joining the department because it's a graduate program um, rather than because that's really where they wanted to go. So, uh, you know, I do think we need to kind of slice and dice the sector differently um, and we probably need a real diverse working group doing that so that we get to see it through different lenses because when you've been in the sector for a little while, I think, you're at risk of being a bit blind to um, how other people might see you. Um, so I do think that that's a community dialogue and it comes back to something I probably said right at the beginning. What the government's talking about at the moment um, is quite exciting for us as a country. You know, we've been called, we've come of age. Um, so I think as more, more people get into that dialogue and start to understand the significance we should see a lot more young people wanting to be a contributor to that significance. Yeah. Maybe slightly idealistic, but I'd like to think that there's truth. Yeah. Give, give, give a round of applause. <laughs>